One of the things I remember about my, one of my uncles is that we had eaten, uh, I guess what we call in the country chitlins, and if you know what chitlins are, but we were city kids and didn't have a clue what they were. And so my grandmother would make them, my mother would make them from time to time, and you know, they, we knew that that was a point when they didn't have a very pleasant smell, but the fact is, my dear could make dirt taste good. And so she would make them and clean them and wash them and clean them and wash them again and boil them and whatever. By the time they got on our plate with a little hot sauce on them, man, that was a, a delicacy. Well, I must have been somewhere fourth, fifth grade because I had been recently baptized and I got baptized in the fourth grade. So I, I know it was somewhere around in that area. We went down to Uncle Bob's down in Mississippi because we were Memphis City kids at that particular time. And my grandmother, who this was her brother, said, we're going to hog killing. Well, I didn't have a clue what hog killing was, but I wanted to see it. So we went down to Mississippi and they were telling us about the different parts of the hog. The poor hog was hanging up there and I wanted to know, well, where does chitlins come from? She said, they come from the hog. And uh, I asked, well, I want to see them. And uh, she pointed to a pile of something smoking over on the ground there. And, and uh, you know, and she said, those are the chitlins. Well, from, it took me a while to ever eat chitlins again once I found out what they were. And because you know what they were, and they were hog guts and they were full. And, uh, and so it was a while before I ate them. In other words, when I found out what they were, I lost my taste for them. And then the relevance of that is, is that, you know, the thing about the world is those that want folks to go in the wrong direction have to make something that really isn't good for them, really doesn't smell good, and really doesn't follow the word, but they've got to make it, make it feel good, taste good, and they've got to make it good. The Lord, I told you yesterday, never talked a whole lot about the devil. He said he's a liar. And when he said he's a liar, that's about all we needed to know. But there are those who are trying to make stuff that is not good for us or to us, those things which are not from God. There are always somebody that's trying to embellish and make things better than what they really are. And when I go to the scriptures, what I see over and over and over again are the warnings against jumping too fast for too little, too deeply. And this is what we've noticed as far as the human race is concerned. This is what God has been concerned about over and over. And so many times he's been concerned about us believing a lie. And which is why we have to preach the truth. This is a time when our preaching should sound louder than it ever has in history, in the history of this country. Because as I told you the last time I was here, we have the most spiritually illiterate generation in the history of our nation. And not only are we spiritually illiterate, we are illiterate as to even our own history. We have a generation that can't tell you who Jesus is, and they probably can't tell you who George Washington is either. They can't tell you anything that the Bible has to offer, nor the Constitution has to offer. They don't understand how to live as a Christian, neither do they understand uh, the privileges of living as an American. And so what we have is a generation that is so disconnected from all the things that many of us grew up believing that it's amazing each and every day how far they have gone down the moral elevator. But the Lord told us this. None of this is news to us. And every one of us knew because of the scriptures that these things were going to happen. And when I go to the Bible, it was probably about early spring when the Apostle Paul is well into his third evangelistic campaign. 
And as the Apostle Paul is preaching, it's somewhere around 57 A.D. Uh, when he is preaching. And Paul is trying to do the best he can uh, to get the word out to men as he has gone from various places and preached the gospel and established churches. In the background of many churches that the Apostle Paul preached to are, seems similar to what we have to deal with today. Folks who are accepting those things that are unsavory, that are impure, that are not tasteful, not delectable spiritually, but someone has shook a little hot sauce on them and sprinkled a little sugar on it and made it taste good to where they can get it down even though it's not good for them. When the Apostle Paul spoke to many of the churches, he was compelled to say similar to them what he had said to the brethren in the Galatian region. In the book of Galatians, chapter 1, verses 6 and verses 7, Paul said, I marvel, I marvel. Paul looked at the brethren in the Galatian region where he had spent, where the gospel rather had been preached. He says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Paul says, it truly surprises me how quickly you gave up, how little you fought, and how fast you failed for something that wasn't good or true or savory for you. And when we see in Galatians chapter 5 and verses 1, the apostle Paul said to the brethren there, he said, stand fast, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free and become not entangled again, as Paul said, to the yoke of bondage. Paul said, why would you allow yourself to get all tied and tangled up in something again once I've gotten you free? When I think about this imagery, every one of you in the church know what Peter said, and Peter given the imagery of apostasy. The pig that returns to the mire, the dog that returns to his vomit. The Apostle Paul is saying to the brethren, we have preached and we have suffered and we have taught and we have enlightened we have in, and we have edified and you've gone right back to the stuff you used to believe. Well, the devil is depending on that because he's not very impressed with us at all. And he's shown that on several occasions that he's not very impressed with God's creation. He wasn't impressed because he came into the garden with the intent of causing Adam and Eve to falter and disobey God's command. He told the first and most diabolical lie that's ever been told because he was not impressed. In the devil's mind, you put him in paradise. You can give him everything. You can shed your love on him and I'll still make him turn against you because I'm going to make him believe that you're holding something back or that there is something better than the simple truth that you have given him. The Bible lets me know that when those came before God, that the devil came, before, came with them in the book of Job. And the scriptures let me know that when God said, I know you're looking at Job. I know you've got your eyes on Job, but it's not going to be as easy as you think because Job is a perfect and upright man. You want to know what the devil, the devil is saying basically, I'm not impressed. I'm not impressed. You put a hedge around him. You give him stuff. You let him prosper. He's got a nice family and children and a wife and herds. He's a big shot. He says, I'm not impressed. You take that stuff away and he'll curse you to your face. Well, that's what the devil thinks about every one of us. He thinks we're frauds and charlatans and liars and weak and indifferent because he got kicked out of heaven for being that, that very thing. And he don't think that we can rise above the position that he found himself. This is why Paul is saying, I marvel. I am just upset. One time he called them old foolish Galatians. He asked them, who bewitched you? Who put a hoodoo on you? Because you have to be taught to be that stupid. And when we look around us right now, 
And we think about the stuff that folks are believing. They didn't believe it on their own. Somebody taught them and helped them to be that intellectually lazy and have that rusty reasoning to where they don't understand the simple, pure word of God. That's why God told you to preach. That's why he told us to teach. That's why he told us to enlighten. That's why God told every last one of us that we have a responsibility. He said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. It's right now, of course, we lift up the the cross of Christ. But they're never going to see Christ, not not until he comes back. Of course, we lift up the the cross of Christ. But they're never going to talk to Christ. They're never going to sit down in church and eat like we did Sunday in the fine meal. That's not going to happen on this earth anymore. But they can do it with you. And the Lord is saying to each and every one of us that I need you to be such in my image that when people see you, that they see me. Because that's how you draw them. You draw them by the fact that you've been altered and changed and fixed and strengthened by the word of God. How many times you heard me say the word of God informs us. The word of God reforms us, and the word of God transforms us. And when we're transformed to the extent that we can show the image of Christ, then the Lord, we're being what the Lord wants us to be. And when the apostle Paul talked to the brethren in the Galatian region, when he said, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you. And would pervert the gospel of Christ. Peter said that they rest or twist the scripture. There's always somebody that's trying to make a lie sound good. My daddy used to say the truth stands on its own. When a lie, you got to come back and lie some more to prop the lie up. And that's what we see happening every year. They've got to come together and convocate and meet and have all the decision makers in the ecclesiastical councils so they can make decisions on what they're going to teach this year. What we teach was delivered unto us by the, as the Apostle Paul said, all scripture, as he spoke to Timothy, is given by inspiration of God. We don't have to come together and decide what we're going to teach and what we're going to believe and what we're going to accept politically and where we're going to stand. We already know wherein we stand because God has already given it to us. Paul is saying, how is it that you were so gullible? How did you become such easy targets? Why did you desert the truth so quickly? There are so many people today who are closing the Bible, and I've heard folks stand up on the floor of the House of Representatives when we're talking about some principle that has a scriptural, a biblical basis and foundation. And they'll stand up and say, well, you know, there are other books other than the Bible. There are other spiritual writings other than those of Christ. There are other messiahs other than Jesus, and I'm sitting there dumbfounded listening to people say stuff like that. Why? Because they've been taught to be stupid. They have been taught to have lazy, uh, 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 lazy reasoning and intellect, and they have allowed themselves, as Paul said to the brethren, I marvel that you were so easily fooled, duped, lied to, to where you desert those things that are true. We as Christians are in a time where we don't have the luxury of sitting around on the seat of do nothing and leaning back on the elbows of do less and say, wake me up when the fight's over. We don't have that luxury anymore. You're warriors of the Lord, and every last one of us need to understand that we've got to preach. We've got to preach. We've got to stand. We've got to teach. We don't have the luxury anymore of saying that somebody great, Brother Good Pastor, Brother Cates, Brother Keeble, Brother Maxwell Barrett Baxter, Brother, and and I can go on and on and on, Brother Braddock, uh, I can go on and on about the men who have stood one time and preached, but they're gone. And many of our treasures today 
are getting older and older and sicker and sicker. And one day they'll stop publishing books and holding gospel meetings. And the next generation has to stand while we decrease. Folks like Jonathan have got to increase. And if the church is going to be what God wants it to be, then we've got to make some stands. And we've got to make, I tell people all the time, I don't want to see the world that my grandchildren have got to live in if we don't change some things right now. And Paul said, I marvel, I marvel that you defected to the enemy so soon. I marvel that you gave up so soon without a fight. And he gave them a wake-up call. Though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than that which we have preached, let him be anathema, let him be a curse. The apostle Paul said to them in Galatians chapter 5, and verses 1, Paul said, stand fast, stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free and be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verses 58, Paul said, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of of the Lord. In essence, Paul said you ought to grow and get stronger, not weaker, as the world's lies and half-truths and perversions get stronger. So should our voice get stronger. We should never retreat to the darkness, to the side of the road in the marketplace. We should never surrender the cross of Christ to those who would pervert it and distort it and desecrate it. Instead, we need to stand as the, as the Bible tells us to. When we read about this man, Saul of Tarsus, he was a self-righteous, cold, merciless zealot. He was blind. He was misguided. He was a man who had lost himself in his own pride and arrogance. He was powerful politically. He was a Roman aristocrat, a Roman citizen. He was connected in a Jewish aristocrat. Nothing about Saul of Tarsus, said gospel preacher. Nothing about him, said gospel preacher. He persecuted, pursued, jailed, and arrested, even stood at the execution of poor Stephen, who stood there and gave the scheme of redemption as Luke records it in the book of Acts. This man, this merciless, heartless zealot, in the book of Acts chapter 8 and verses 3, Saul gave his own history. He knew that there were many in the church who knew what he used to do. Saul took responsibility and ownership of his history and let them know that he had changed. Saul said, or Paul said, as for Saul, the Bible let us know during that time that he made havoc. He made havoc of the church entering into every house and hailing and hauling and dragging men and women and committing them to prison. Can you imagine what it must have been like to be sitting around in your house and somebody knocks on your door in the middle of the night and drag your husband out and you never see him again? Knock on your door in the middle of the night and drag your son or your daughter or your wife out and you never see him again? Our brothers and sisters 2,000 years ago lived in that horror. They lived that terror. They lived that persecution. They lived that sacrifice. And they understood what it meant when they said that they were a Christian, that it wasn't just a statement of their Sunday activities, but it often meant their very life would be taken for what they believed. Saul admitted it. Paul admitted it. In Acts chapter 22 and verses 4, he said, And I, and I persecuted the way unto death, binding and delivering into prison both men and women. He said, Yes, I did it. And he asked for their forgiveness. Yes, I did it. Because at that time, Saul of Tarsus was a man credentialed, but he was not spiritual. He was a man that was religious, 
but he was not reverent. He was the type of individual who was a relentless persecutor because he was more concerned about his credentials than he was about his character. And there are many, of t- many today who stand in the pulpit, both in and out of the church, who are more concerned about their reputation, their credentials, and how they're going to profit. I said that many young men and these days women go to these theological cemeteries where they go and bury their faith and come out dead spiritually because they don't even believe the Bible that they claim to preach. And that's what's happening now. As religion in America becomes nothing but another big rotten business in our nation. That's what it's becoming more and more. And this is why you've got to preach. You've got to get over the noise. You've got to speak louder than the naysayers. Louder than those who are saying this old Bronze Age book is out of style. You've got to speak louder than them. Those who are saying that Christ is the same as Buddha and others, you got to speak louder than them. And that's what the Lord tells us to do. He tells us to preach, preach, preach. We see in the scripture the tale of two rabbis, two teachers, two lives apparently opposite of men born about the same time and who lived about the same time. Saul of Tarshish born into wealth and comfort and uh, uh, prestige. This man, he lived in, the, in Tarshish, the capital city of Cilicia, and he went to the best university in the empire. He went to the University of Tarshish. He was mentored and taught by the best of the rabbis, by Gamaliel. He sat at the feet of Gamaliel. He could brag with the best of them. And looking in retrospect, as he wrote our brethren in the Philippi, at Philippi, in Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through verses 7, he let them know that there was a time when I was so caught up in myself and my stuff and my credentials and my reputation that I was not a gospel preacher but I was a persecutor of those that did. He said to those folks who were going down the same path he was going down, he said, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man think it, that he had whereof that he might trust in the flesh, Saul or Paul, the apostle said, I more. He said, let me give you my credentials. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, touching the law, I was a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, I persecuted the church. And this is what Paul is saying is, if you want to talk about credentials, you want to compare education, I can top all of you. But you know what he said? Every bit of it is rubbish. None of it helped me be a better person. None of it helped me be stronger spiritually. None of it changed my character to where God could look down upon me and see that I was a faithful servant. Instead, what Saul is saying, what Paul is saying, is that all that stuff that I love, rather than loving my God, my Father, and my Creator, it pulled me further and further away from my God. Don't you realize the Lord said one time as he was sitting there on that hill that we spoke about the other day, he said, lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust that corrupt and thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust that corrupt nor thieves break through and steal. The Lord said, here's the reason why I'm telling you this. Because where your treasure is, that's where your heart, your commitment is going to be also. When we commit ourselves simply to doing and getting and being what everybody else, when we commit ourselves to power and prestige and position and popularity and prosperity, we lose ourselves. And that's what the Lord is trying to tell us. The Lord is saying, I need y'all to save the world. 
I need you to change things. And the Lord is looking down on us, and he's expecting us to do it. Too many of us lose sight of those simple things. All, Saul, of all the things that he could brag about, Jesus excelled without any of those trappings. Jesus excelled. The Bible lets me know that he grew in wisdom in Luke chapter 2, verses 42, that this country boy from Nazareth, he grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor of God and man. You know what it means. He grew in wisdom. He grew intellectually. He grew in stature. He grew physically. He grew in favor of God. He grew spiritually. He grew in favor of man. He grew socially. Jesus was well-rounded while Saul of Tarsus had all of that expensive education. Jesus was the one that excelled in his character, and people would look at him and the Bible says they heard him and were astonished at his understanding and his answers. Without the University of Tarshish, without Gamaliel, they were astonished at his teaching. When Jesus was choosing his disciples, Nathaniel voiced a commonly heard and commonly spoken prejudice against Jesus to Philip. In the book of John, chapter 1, and verses 46, can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? You know what Philip said to him? Come and see. Come and see. And that's what we need to start telling folks. Come and see. You want the truth? You come and see. You want what's right? You come and see. And stop letting folks be impressed with the things of this world, but instead let them be impressed with the things which are from God. What am I trying to tell you tonight, church? Preaching, 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 teaching, preaching, teaching, standing. Those were always in God's plan of redemptive religion. It's not, oh, well, I guess you may as well preach, but preaching was always part of it. In the book of Titus chapter 1, verses 1 through verses 3, Paul speaking to Titus, who he had left at Crete. Paul said, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. He went on to say, in hope of eternal life which God, which cannot lie, promised before the world began. Before there was sin, there was already a Savior. But hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which Paul said is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. And this is the Apostle Paul says to the church then, just as he says to the church now, we've got to preach. We can't withdraw. We cannot walk away. But we've got to preach even harder than we've ever preached. I remember when I, I told you before, when I wanted to start preaching as a young fellow, my daddy wouldn't let me do it. He would say over and over, you're not ready, Nick. You're not ready. Fifth grade, I've been baptized a year. Can I preach? He said, you're not ready, Nick. You're not ready. Sixth grade, I've been baptized two years. I know the scripture. I can do the communion. I can lead a prayer. At that time, I was a song leader. And I, even in the sixth grade, I was going from church to church leading songs. He said, you're still not ready. And he wouldn't let me preach. This was a constant discussion at our dinner table. So my grandfather, Papa Stalin, made me a little pulpit. I told you about that pulpit. And we had this area in our house, this big closet. And I put my pulpit there. And my sisters and brothers and a couple of my neighbors and others were my church. And, you know, my church broke up. They said I preached too long. And, um, but, but the fact of the matter is, I, my daddy would tell me over and over, you're not ready, Nick. You're not ready. And he didn't let me really start preaching. I preached my first sermon when I was 15 years old after my daddy had moved or was transferred to a small town. I told you about it. 
about 25 people, from that church with 600 and something people to a little church with 25 people. And when I had to work and understood what work in the church meant, when I understood that it meant responsibility, that if I'm not there, there's nobody to do it. That's when he let me preach my first sermon and, and, uh, and when I was 15 years old because I had to realize the importance of preaching, that it was not just being cute or just being seen or just being heard. Why? Because preaching, preaching is God's response to encroaching and pervasive sin. God didn't tell us, as I said the other day, to do anything other than to preach and to stand and to teach. Paul the preacher warned Timothy of an ominous uh, uh, coming in the church. In the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through verses 5, Paul says, I need to tell you something, young man. I need to tell you something. This know also. That in latter times, or in the last days, peerless times shall come. And then Paul went down the moral elevator, saying, For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, and unholy. That's a terrible thing to tell a young preacher, that this is what you're going to have to preach to. This is the way that people are going to be. And he went on to say they will be without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fears, despisers of those that are good. He said traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And he tops it off that they're still going to be religious, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. When you think about what Paul was saying, Paul was saying this is what we have to deal with. When we look at the news every day, when we look at the homes breaking up, when we look at the children being unraised, when we look at the families that are dysfunctional, when we look at the unions where folks are not committed the way God wants us to be committed, you see everything that the Apostle Paul was talking about. What's the remedy? What's the remedy? Paul said, preach, preach. That's the remedy. You preach the gospel. After speaking of those who are caught, taken captive into the devil's prison camp, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 25 and verses 26, Paul wanted Timothy to understand something. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verses 1, Paul said, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. God's word, my brothers and sisters, is not in a state of metamorphosis. It's not in a state of evolution. God's word is, does not have to catch up with history. We're not on the wrong side of history. But what God wants us to do is preach, not some new world order, not some new morality, some new principles of how to live. God wants us to stand on those things that are written in his pages of inspiration because he doesn't want anybody to be lost. This is the very reason why Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verses 9 that God is not willing. He is not willing. He's not willing that any should perish. So God wants us to try to save them. He wants us to preach. The remedy is not getting on the right side of history, walking away from the Bronze Age book, change and becoming more contemporary. Stop telling folks that Jesus is the Son of God. The solution is to preach the truth. Paul said to Timothy, I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Paul said, preach the word. Preach the word. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort 
with all long suffering and doctrine. In essence, the Apostle Paul said, preach the word. Preach it. We have so many people today who are embarrassed to preach the word. You've heard me say before, you ask some folks, are you a Christian? They say, well, I, I, I think so. I, I might be. I could be. I should be. I'm, I'm working on it. Uh, are you a member of the Church of Christ? Well, uh, um, uh, yeah. Are you going to heaven? Well, I, I think so. I could be. I'm, I'm trying to. I'm working on it. Uh, are you saved? Well, uh, I hope so. I think I am. I'm working on it. Well, you know, the answer is, are you a Christian? The answer is yes. Yes, I'm a Christian. Are you saved? Absolutely. Yes, I'm saved. You're going to heaven? Yes, I'm going to heaven. I'm a citizen of heaven right now. Do you believe in Jesus? Of course I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He came to this world and he died for my sins and he gave his blood for my redemption and my atonement. He became my perpetuation, my substitute. He took my beating and he died on a cross between two thieves so that I might be saved. Yes. Are you a member of the Church of Christ? Absolutely. Why would not be? The Lord told me, as recorded when Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea and Philippi, that he asked his disciples, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, and what's out in the marketplace? What are they saying about me out there? They said, some say you John the Baptist or one of the prophets, Jeremiah, just any old dead prophet. They'd send you anybody but the Son of God. But Jesus did to them what he does to us today. Jesus turned to them and said, what do you say? What say ye? What's your opinion? What will you tell folks when they say I'm somebody other than the Son of God? Peter said, you are the Christ. You're the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said to Peter on that day, on one of his better days, when his speaking spoke the absolute truth, Jesus said, blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, Simon, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood is not revealed this. You didn't get this in the marketplace. You didn't hear this down at the water fountain. You didn't get this from the folks gossiping in the street. Flesh and blood has not revealed this unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, upon this truth that you have just so ably spoken, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Don't you understand? And the Lord said, I'm going to give you legislative authority. All of you, I'm going to give you legislative authority. I will give unto you the keys to the kingdom. Whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven because he'd already told him, I'm going to send another comforter. He's not going to depend upon them to give the word, but the Holy Spirit will come and speak through them the inspired word of God and therefore give us those things that we know is true. My brothers and sisters, what the Lord said on that day is, I'm building a church. Yes, why wouldn't I be a part? Why wouldn't I be a member and accept the grace of that which the Lord built and shed his blood for? In Titus chapter 2 and verses 1, Paul told Titus, speak thou, speak thou. When you preach, speak thou. When you teach, speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. That word becomes, comes from a Greek term which means supports and represents and engenders. In essence, when you talk, folks ought to hear the truth, not those things that are wrong. My daddy used to say, some preachers are curveball preachers. They wind up and they throw and it goes and don't hit nobody in the church because they're not trying to put people where they ought to be so that their hearts are pricked. You know what God wants us to do? God don't want us to be socially acceptable. God didn't send us out to make friends and be friendly. Now, don't get me wrong. No, go lying on me. The Lord wants us to preach the truth in love. He wants us to be long-suffering and caring. He wants us to be spiritual when we're trying to correct people. 
but he wants us to let them know what is true. And even if they get offended, like they got offended with the Lord, the Lord said, leave them alone because they're blind and they're leaders of the blind. What the Lord wants us to do is to speak the truth, even when it's not popular. And folks are doing everything they can to silence the truth. Speak the truth. In verse 11 and verses 12, for the grace of God, Paul said to Titus in that same chapter, that bring it salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Soberly, my responsibility to myself. Don't get drunk with pride. Don't get drunk with materialism. Don't get drunk with worldliness. Don't get drunk with the things of this world that attend to the lust of the flesh. Soberly, stay sober, keep a clear head so that I can go to heaven one day and hear my Lord say, well done. Soberly, take care of me righteously. Take care of your brother. My responsibility to my brothers in Christ. The Lord has taught me and told me that we are to be pitiful to one another, kind to one another. We are to be spiritually minded when one falls away. In other words, what the Lord is saying is, y'all be righteous people, godly. Let me always reverence the one who has created me. Paul went on to tell us, these things speak and exhort and rebuke. Notice what he said, with all authority, let no man despise thee. In other words, don't let anybody tell you not to preach, not to stand, and not to teach. Notice these words, speak, exhort, rebuke, authority. In essence, what God's men and God's women are to be strong and they are to be resilient and they are not to quit. Let me tell you this before I sit down tonight. Paul said one time to the brethren, not as though I have already attained, either was already perfect, but I follow after. Paul said that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Jesus. Paul said, brethren, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth unto those things which are before. Paul says, I can't live in the past. He, Paul is saying, y'all, I, I am not going to every day live what I used to be when I was Saul of Tarsus. I'm going to press toward the mark of the high calling of Jesus Christ. You know what that mark is? The Lord wants us to transform to the image of Christ. And Christ is the mark for each and every one of us. Paul said, because of my past, I worked harder. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verses 10, Paul said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace was bestowed upon me. And not in vain, Paul said, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Paul says, because I owed so much. The problem with so many people in the church today and in the world today. I was telling some folks recently, and I have so many friends, they become so haughty. And I said to them, you've forgotten where God brought you from. You've forgotten how low you were in sin before the Lord lifted you up. You've forgotten how blind you may have been before the Lord gave you the light. And every day of our lives, we need to thank God that he saved us at a time when we could have been lost. And we were brought back to him because of his love and his kindness and his goodness. So God's men and women always understand that they put themselves in jeopardy. They put themselves even in danger, but they fight their way through it. Paul says, I press. 
When Paul says, I press, he could have substituted, I preach. I preach. Forgetting past allegiances, forgetting past comforts and goals and agendas and influence, many have lost the mission, they have lost the message, and they have lost the methodology. The Lord wants us to get back to the preaching of the truth and the standing on those things which are right. My brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, we all know because what we see every day, we understand the direction the world was going in. Uh, in the days of Paul, and we understand the direction the world is going in in our day also. But the Apostle Paul wanted the brethren to know in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 and verses 13, Paul says, And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me that he counted me faithful, putting me in the ministry, who was before a blasphemer, a persecutor, and Paul said, I was injurious. As I said earlier, nobody saw Saul, I saw the apostle Paul in Saul of Tarshish, but God did. God did. And as I told you the other day, when they went to Jesse's house, the prophet went to Jesse's house to find the king of Israel. Everybody looked better. But the one God wanted was the one when he looked into his heart, he said, that's who I want to lead my people. Every day of our lives, we should study, be diligent to show ourselves approved. When the Lord looks at us and he looks in our heart, be diligent to show yourself approved. When the Lord looks at us, let him see us striving to be like his son, to walk and talk like his son. When the Lord looks at us, let him see the example of people who realize that there is nothing the world can do to us that can destroy us or can hurt us because we can do all things through Christ which strengthens us. The Lord's coming back one day. My mother was working for a little while there, and I may have told you this a few years ago. My mother wanted a new washing machine. My daddy basically said it's not in the budget right now, so my mother went and worked part-time at a place called Steinberg's, I believe it was, or something. It was a department store in Memphis. And before she left home, she told us, all right, now this is your daddy's tea. The red Kool-Aid is for dinner, so don't drink it. There's the lunch meat for your lunches for the rest of the week. In other words, she pointed out all the stuff that we weren't supposed to touch, and she pointed to the stuff that we could eat while she was at work. I don't know what happened to us. For some reason, we lost our mind. We drank up our daddy's tea, drank up all the red Kool-Aid, ate up the lunch meat that was for, for lunch, and I'm the oldest. There are only about four of us at that particular time, and my other brother was, was just a baby. We ate up the lunch meat. We ate up the bread. We did everything. We played. We touched. We did everything she told us to do, and then it hit us. Mama's coming back. And you're talking about a bunch of children in terror because we know what's coming, because we've done everything she told us not to do. And when she came, you know, it was some sad singing and slow walking. Because mama would make you go get your own switch. She would tell you, go get it. And you better not bring one in that breaks on the first lick. Because mama was a profound switchologist. And she had a switch, I told y'all, that would turn corners. When mama came, she got all of us. The fact of the matter is, we forgot. Mama's coming back. Mama's coming back. We forgot about it. And when mama came back, and when we thought about it, we were in a panic. The Lord says, I'm coming back. I'm coming back one day. As the angel stood there on the mountain with the apostles gazing up into heaven, the angel says, what are y'all gazing up to heaven? He told you he's coming back. He told y'all to go down to Jerusalem to get ready to preach the gospel. He's coming back. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled in John 14, 1. You believe in God. Believe also in me. 
In my father's house are many mansions, many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going to get the house ready. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am there, you may be also. The Lord says, I'm coming back. Paul says, you'll meet him on a cloud. You'll meet him in the air. The scriptures let us know the dead in Christ. God's not going to leave us down in all that chaos. He's going to wake you up first. God wants you to know. Jesus is telling you, I'm coming back. You need to hear my word before I come back. You need to hear that God so loved the world that he sent me to save your souls. You need to hear that I came and put on the flesh and I lived that I took on while I was half dead. Forty days with no food and substance and the most powerful diabolical entity came to tempt me when I was half dead. He waited to my weakest moment the same way he's going to do with you. And he tempted me with the lust of the flesh and I said no, the lust of the eye. I said no, the pride of life. I said no, the very things that have made you fall all the way from Adam and throughout your history as human beings I came and overcame it. I stood for you, and I didn't quit. I could have given up. I could have called a legion of angels and destroyed everybody. I told Pontius Pilate to his face when he's standing there like a big shot telling me, why don't you answer me? You see me fighting for you, boy. Why don't you speak to me and help me fight for your life? He said, don't you know I've got the power to release you or kill you? And Jesus, in one of the few times that he even spoke during that ordeal, I think he looked him dead in his eye and said, you don't have the power to do anything. I give my life. You don't take my life. I give my life. For this reason I came. He had to tell Peter this when Peter had grabbed him from the back. and He said, get behind me, Satan. Because you're trying to keep me from the mission that my father sent me, though he were a son. Yet learned the obedience. He obeyed. He obeyed. He knew what they were going to do to him, but he obeyed. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things he suffered or endured. When I believe that with all of my heart, what I'm saying, God, is you've got my attention, and I respond by realizing that you love me enough to tell me the truth. While others are lying, and while others are desecrating your book, and talking about your son, and perverting the truth, you open my eyes and let me see that I was lost. The greatest gift that you can give any person is salvation. And God gave us salvation. I believe it. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The Hebrew writer says, faith, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. In essence, the Hebrew writer is telling me that my faith, it lays a foundation rock solid so that I can learn and add to my faith virtue and knowledge and temperance and patience and brotherly kindness and love because I believe, I believe, because I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, because I believe that God in sundry times and divers manners in time past spoken to the fathers by the prophet hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, because I believe that I repent. I'm going to change, Lord. Lord, you could have struck me down dead when I was out there acting a fool, and you didn't do it. When I was a liar and a crook and a cheat, when I was unfaithful and unholy and indifferent, you could have struck me down dead, but you didn't do it. You let me hear the truth. I repent, Lord. I repent, Lord. In godly sorrow, I'm so sorry, Lord. I'm so sorry. Thank you, Lord, for giving me the chance to say, I repent. I repent. I'm changing. And I want everybody to know that I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. 
He's the one that gave me the right to repent. I didn't have this right to repent. I didn't earn it. I didn't merit it. We haven't lived right. We didn't deserve it. But I repent because Jesus died for my sins. And I want everybody to know that I believe it. And I want my old man buried. Anything dead need buried. I'm not going to embolden him. I'm not going to give him life. I'm not going to feed him. I'm not going to care for this old man. I want him dead and buried. And I bury my old man in the watery grave. And the Lord said, you stand up. The word resurrection means to stand up again. When you stand up again, from that liquid, that liquid grave to stand up again as a child of God. The Lord wants you to know that you're my child now. I put everything that you've done and said in the sea of forgiveness and it's gone. You are chosen now, you're my children. Chosen to show the difference between the holy and the profane. Chosen to preach the truth and love. Chosen to lift the cross of Christ, chosen to let the light shine in darkness, to be salt and seasoning and savoring in a perverted world, chosen to be steadfast and unmovable, chosen to fight the good fight of faith, to earnestly contend and stand for those things are true. You're my people now because you've been born again, a new future, a new name, a new family, you belong to me now. And for the rest of your life, you act like it. My daddy used to tell me, boy, I gave you my name. Don't you hurt it. Don't you hurt my name. He used to tell me that all the time when I was growing up and when I would leave to go on a scout trip or go on a, a basketball game or wherever I was, he would say, boy, I gave you my name. Don't you hurt it. Christ is telling us the same thing. I gave you my name. Don't you hurt it. If we fall away, Repent of it, acknowledge it. God says, I love you, and I'll forgive you every time you ask me. When I look in your heart, and remember, I'm the only one that can look in your heart. Everybody else is looking on the outside, but I'm looking at your heart. And when I see godly sorrow, I don't care what you've done. If I see godly sorrow and repentance, I'm going to forgive you every time. Don't you ever bow your head and walk through your life talking about, I'm too sinful to be saved. Don't ever do that. It's God's children. God said, I'm your father. And I gave my son the story of the prodigal. He told you that so you will know. When you come home, he said, put a ring on that boy's finger so folks will know he belonged to somebody. Put a coat on his back. We don't want folks seeing his nakedness. Because my son was lost, but now... He's found. He was blind. But now he sees. The Lord loves you. Think about it while we stand this up.